Right. So, a sincere welcome to everyone in this lecture theatre. What a terrific turnout it is. I counted around 135 people, which is this term's record. Um, how many students present are interested in fashion? Hands up. Millions of you. Um, how many amongst those were blokes? <laughs> okay, that's good. Excellent. Um, it's very good to see members of the, the public again. It's terrific that you can be present. Part of the idea of this series of lectures is for us in the journalism department to reach out to the Lincoln public and engage you with us in the sort of things we do and to give you a, an insight in the exciting times, the challenging experiences we give our students. So really sincere welcome to you all. We have the most Mondays of term, as you probably know, and you're welcome to come to all of them. Um, and let us know what you think of them. I, I'm on email, I'm on the uh, university website, so please email me. It's Richard Keeble, rkeeble at Lincoln. Okay, let me uh, go about welcoming our speakers tonight. I hardly need introduce Angela Rippon. Um, Angela, we're thrilled, is now a visiting professor at Lincoln University. And along with many other titles. She has the OBE for services to journalism. Would not be really worthwhile going through her long and distinguished career. Uh, she was, of course, the first regular woman on the BBC to read the national news. She has been on many, many programs. For instance, she was the, the anchor for the wedding of Princess Charles and Diana. And in the car coming up, what was one of her most exciting times as a journalist? She was the anchor when Gorbachev was overthrown in a coup in 1991. And for that, she won quite a few international awards. Um, currently, of course, she's uh, well known for her uh, rip-off Britain, and I believe she's busy filming uh, a new series of that. Is that right, Angela? Just finished filming. We're into the stage where we're doing voiceovers now, and it hits the screens on the 28th of November on daytime, and in January it'll be on prime time. Is that a plug? <laughs> <laughs> no. <Yes. laughs> um, on my far left is Sophia Shashanovic. Um, she is the fashion expert. After leaving uh, City University, where I taught, uh, she went to America, was in PR, has been back to the UK and has specialised successfully in fashion freelancing. She is um, busy, having worked for... Vogue Italia, those of you who know Vogue magazine know that Italia is one of the most prestigious of those titles to work for. And she has worked for Harper's Bazaar Russian, um, Sophia being Ukrainian by birth. So let's welcome our two speakers. There's a, there's a very practical basis for today's proceedings, we thought, right, let's get some real tips about how it's done and from the experts. Angela is going to start with 10 top tips for broadcasting. Um, when Richard said he wanted me to come and talk to you, 10 top tips for broadcasting, um, it was actually quite difficult because, and it reminded me of a story about Rostropovich, the great cellist, who was on his way to give a concert at the Metropolitan in New York, and he was walking to the Metropolitan, 
uh, to the Opera House and um, a newcomer to New York stopped him in the street and didn't know who he was, just thought he was a passerby and said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me how long will it take me to get to the Metropolitan? And Rostropovich said, a lifetime. <laughs> and so what I've tried to do is distill down some of the experience that I've had in the last uh, 45 years in broadcasting and uh, just share a few thoughts with you in areas that um, might be quite uh, quite useful because after 45 years I am still learning and so it really is impossible to uh, to restrict it to 10 but I've chosen 10 which um, hopefully will be of use to you and I'm going to start um, not with something that you might expect but I'm going to start by asking you to know how important it is if you're going to be a broadcaster that you start out by knowing what your attitude is to fame now there are a lot of very famous broadcasters. Going back, we've got people like Richard Dimbleby, Robin Day from a, another era, Paxman, John Humphreys, John Simpson, John Snow, David Attenborough, Christiane Anambapur, Martin Bell. They're all names that many of you will know. The in interesting thing is that none of them set out to be famous. They just set out to be good at what they do. Unlike singers, unlike actors, unlike, po unlike politicians for whom fame is important, for broadcasters, it's a sort of byproduct of what we do. We're in people's homes on a regular basis. We have regular contact with the public. They trust us, they recognize us. And so if you're any good at what you do, you do become famous. But broadcasting is full of a lot of people who will never be famous. They are just people who do the job and do it really, really well. And you will hear their names, but they won't necessarily become famous. And I'm, I've started with this because I get so many parents who come up to me and say, my son, my daughter, wants to be in television. And I say to them, what do they want to do? And they say they want to work in television. And I say, but what do they want to do? And what it comes down to is they have the Jane Goody syndrome. They want to be famous. So I'm going to start by saying that if you want to be famous, Journalism is not necessarily the career for you. Journalism, broadcast journalism, is not necessarily the career for you. It will be a brilliant career for you. It will give you amazing opportunities to travel, to meet extraordinary people, and do amazing things. It gives you the opportunity to be right up the sharp end of all the most important local, national, and international news stories. But it will not necessarily make you famous. So if that's what you've got in mind, forget it. It may happen, and if it does, it'll be wonderful. And the cardinal rule for that is never let it go to your head. And that will uh, Im have implications in Rule 9 when I come to it, and you'll understand why. There are advantages to being famous. There are also disadvantages. You lose your privacy. There are constant high expectations of who you are and what you do. And if it has been your main goal, when it fades, it can take you quite a long time to get over it. And that is what happens. Broadcasting, radio and television is littered with people who were overnight sensations, famous people, never heard of them anymore. But if it does happen to you as a broadcaster, while you have it, enjoy it, embrace it, accept the responsibilities that go with it, but don't ever take it for granted. Number two. I'm going to put number two and number three together. To be a broadcaster, you really must listen, watch, and read. Three of them there, but they really come into two. Listen and watch being the most important. As journalists, as broadcasters, you will, over a lifetime, develop your own style. That will make you stand out from the crowd. But while you're developing that style, watch and learn from the experts and those who are not so expert. If you want to, for instance, be a travel correspondent, if there's something you particularly want to do, if there's an area in which you want to specialise as a broadcaster, be it travel, politics, theatre, health, education, finance, whatever, read everything you can about that subject. I was talking to somebody earlier who says he wants to work in, in show business. That's wonderful. And I said to him, do you know who um, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers are? 
he didn't know. Sorry, but if you want to work in any specialist area, you have to know your subject inside out. Not just the headlines, not just the things you're going to read in Hello Magazine, not just the things you're going to read in The Sun or The Mirror or The Telegraph or what you know from your own personal experience from the last five years. You must know your subject inside out all the way back to the last 50 years. That knowledge will give you the most extraordinary foundation and it means you will be able to put what happens now into context, into historical context. And I gave a silly example, but it's, it's a relevant one. I saw a program recently which said, who are the best dancers in the world? Beyonce was voted the best dancer in the world. She may be the best dancer on a pop video, Sure as hell, she ain't the best dancer in the world. Not if you look at her historically and judge her against people like Ginger Rogers, whom you've never heard of, against uh, lots of wonderful, wonderful people who are good at what they do. So if you want to get credibility in whatever subject you do, you really must know your subject inside out so that you have a basis on which you can make relevant comparisons. Politics. Let me give you an example. I was standing in the newsroom at ITN a few years ago talking to Trevor MacDonald and the pair of us were sounding like a pair of old dinosaurs and Trevor and I were talking about the fact that you know, an awful lot of the people in the newsroom were so young they didn't know anything and suddenly one of the kids from behind one of the computers stood up and said to the assembled newsroom, can somebody remind me, was Callaghan ever a Prime Minister? <laughs> Sorry, but if you're going to work in broadcasting, if you're going to work in politics, you should know that sort of thing. So just knowing what's happened for the last 12 months or while you've been a student, or even in your lifetime, is not enough. Know your subject. Learn from the experts. Watch and listen, not just to what they say, but how they say it. I think I've spoken before about the person that I think is one of the best people on radio, Eddie Mayer. Listen to him on Radio 4 p.m. every day. He's there. He has not only got a wonderful voice, the timbre of his voice is absolutely perfect as a broadcaster. If you've got a rotten voice, don't even think about going into radio. Your accent is wonderful. <laughs> Accents are terrific. Regional accents are wonderful. But if you've got a high-pitched voice, a funny old squeak, you can't bring your tone down, forget it. You're never going to make a radio broadcaster. Work on it. Listen to the way that Eddie Mayer uses his voice. Listen to how he interviews. He can pin a politician to the wall and the politician doesn't even feel the nails. He is such a good interviewer. Listen to what he does, how he does it. Watch Jon Snow on Channel 4 News. Watch how he presents. He has enormous presence and great credibility. Watch and learn from him. Watch from the two of them, how they do it. Listen to Radio 4's from our own correspondent. It's on twice a week. It gets one airing and then it's repeated again. Listen to from our own correspondent and hear how radio correspondents are able to paint pictures. They can tell you what the smell is like in the streets of Baghdad. They can tell you what the traffic is like on Fifth Avenue. You've got Technicolor and smell -O vision because they paint pictures with words. If you want to be a broadcast journalist, you have to know how to use words to paint pictures. Listen and watch also to the not so good. Audiences are very discerning and you have to be too. Hear bad delivery, listen to poor interviewing techniques, listen to muddled reports, Think to yourself, what did that person do wrong? How can it be improved? Let others make the mistakes from which you will learn. They do it badly, don't you do it. You've learnt from their mistakes. You will then, from that, develop your own style. Do not copy. Be an original. Take the best from what other people have, but adapt it to your own style. Given the choice between an original and a pale imitation, a producer will go for the original every time. <coughs> an example, he's not actually a journalist, but an example, Justin Lee Collins, he has a very quirky delivery. He plays on his Bristolian accent, but he is as sharp as a samurai sword. He knows precisely what he's doing. That's why he's good. It's also why he's become famous. So listen and learn and develop your own style. Number four, delivery. I made my first broadcast 45 years ago this year, in September 1966. 
I had been in journalism for five years before that, as a photographer for two years, a reporter for three years. I had that wonderful anonymity that comes from working in print. My name, my byline was accompanied some of my photographs and many of my stories, but I was relatively anonymous. When I went into a television studio at BBC Plymouth and did my very, very first broadcast, I've still got the script, it was about the salt ash oyster beds, I've still got the contract, the BBC paid me the princely sum of £6.10 shillings for my very first job. <laughs> I often feel I should uh, make a copy of the contract and send it to Jonathan Ross, but anyway. <laughs> When I got home, my father, who was a Royal Marine and then an engineer, not a broadcaster, knew nothing about broadcasting, he was just a viewer. He said to me, that was terrible. You look like a rabbit caught in the headlights. And I said, I was absolutely terrified, Dad. It's quite different sitting in a studio looking at a red light and knowing that you've got thousands of people listening to you and watching you. And my father, not a broadcaster, gave me the best piece of advice that I ever received and that I can pass on to you as a broadcaster. My father said, talk to me. Look at the lens, look at the microphone, talk to me. And my dad knew what I had not recognised. I mean, subsequently, I've done programmes where I've reported to literally 83 million people. I've done the Eurovision Song Contest, I've done things for BBC World, I've done things for Bloomberg Television, where there have been millions, telephone numbers of people. But people listen to television, listen to the radio, watch television in ones and twos. Think of your own example. Mostly at home, husband and wife, girlfriend and boyfriend, flatmates. There's rarely more, there's never, unless I'm doing a live broadcast to a live audience, I'm going to be talking and you are going to be talking to one or two or three people at the most. Talk to one person. When you're doing an interview, one person is the third member of that conversation. There's you, the interviewee, and your listener. When Terry Wogan on Radio 2 refers to listener, he knows what he's talking about. People are listening in ones and twos. That's what you do. Keep your listener, your viewer, in mind. It's what identifies and separates a broadcaster from a communicator. You may go into broadcasting, but what you are doing is communicating with individuals. And if you forget that there's 83 million people watching you, or 130 million people watching you, or listening to you, but just one or two, you will hone in and you will talk to an individual. It will make you a good communicator as well as a good broadcaster. Number five, be honest with yourself about your ability. Never mind what other people say, listen to yourself, watch yourself, be objective and critical if need be, but always be honest. I'll tell you a story about when I was working in America for CBS. We had a particularly unpleasant story unfolding in Boston at the time. It was a gang rape of a girl. She'd been gang raped by seven young Portuguese men at a place called Big Dan's Bar, and she'd been gang raped on the pool table in the bar. Subsequently, Jodie Foster made a film called The Accused, based on this true story, and she actually won an Oscar for her performance. But it was a true story that was unfolding in 1984 when I was working in Boston for CBS. We had a young reporter who had to cover the whole trial, which was a very difficult trial because it involved a lot of ethnicity. There were, it was the Portuguese population. It was, there were lots of ethnic tensions in the area. It went on, dragged on for a very long time. There were lots of very unpleasant details. And at the end, in the American law system, the young girl had to then listen to the judges summing up and what his judgment and sentencing was going to be. And she'd covered this story for something like six weeks on a regular basis. And on the final night, when the judge gave his summing up, she had to give a three-minute live piece to camera into our 10 o'clock news bulletin. And she did it quite brilliantly. She summed up the whole thing, she summed up what the judge said, and she gave an absolutely perfect piece of live broadcast reporting. The following morning when she came into the studio, I said to her, Dolores, that was absolutely brilliant. You did that absolutely fantastically. And without a shadow of irony 
or big-headedness. She looked me straight in the face and said, I know, Angela, I'm really good at that kind of thing. <laughs> Without missing a beat, she said, what I really know I'm not very good at is doing interviews, and I know I just have to work at that. And sometime, you know, can you and I sit down and we can kind of talk about this? And that was an amazing lesson for me because she was honest with herself. <laughs> she was being proud of what she could do well, but equally, she acknowledged her shortcomings, and that's what you must always do. Be honest about those things that you're good at, but equally acknowledge those things which need brushing up, that you're not so good at, and work at them. Now, you may find, even if you work at them, that there are certain things that you can't do. But broadcasting is that. It's not narrow casting, it's broadcasting. There are lots of opportunities in broadcasting. <coughs> Reporting, researching, producing, directing, being a, a, a correspondent, being a news re reader, whatever. There are lots of areas of broadcasting. Discover those things that you are good at, work at them. The things that you are not so good at, equally work at them so that you become a fully rounded professional broadcaster. She actually went on to win a Pulitzer Prize for her journalism. She did perfect her interviewing technique. She recognised her failings, she worked at them, and that's what you must do. Number six on my list, interviewing. Now, I spent some time the last time I was here talking about interviewing with a group of you, so I'm not going to go into the whole detail of that because we could be here all night. I will just say the most important thing you must do, and I cannot emphasise this enough, you must, before you go to interview anybody, do your research. Do not turn up without having read the press release, without having, if you have the opportunity, depending on the kind of interview that it is, to research into the person or the subject that you are doing an interview about. I was interviewed literally last week by one of the senior feature writers of a, a, a national woman's magazine. She had not read the press release. She had not bothered to look at my, my CV. It was a complete waste of time. And she was a senior feature writer on a national magazine. Do not ever fall into that trap because it diminishes the effectiveness of your skills and your position as an interviewer. It is insulting to the person that you are going to see if you have not bothered to research properly. It means you are not in command of what you are doing. Now, if you've got just a 30-second interview quickly for a news bulletin, make the first question count. It may be the only one that you've got, the only opportunity you've got. Make that first question count. Think about the kind of interview that you're doing. If you're going to be interviewing shall we say for argument's sake, the, the mother of a recently murdered child, clearly your style of interviewing is going to be totally different from the style that you're going to use if you're talking to the chairman of the local football club or a politician, and I'll talk about politicians particularly in a moment. Recognise the style of interviewing that you are going to have to employ to get the most out of the person to whom you are speaking. And do not be afraid of silences. Very often, having asked a question and sitting quietly, the person that you are interviewing will feel obliged to say something, to fill the gap. So do not feel you have to keep talking. Be aware that it's brave sometimes and sensible to stay silent. Resist the urge to interrupt unnecessarily. Listen to what is being said. Listen to Radio 4 in the morning and you will hear what I mean about <coughs> interviewers who annoy the hell out of me because they constantly interfere and interrupt the people that they are interviewing. I could throw a brick at the radio some mornings. It is an incredibly bad habit. If you've asked someone a question and you want to hear what they've got to say, listen to it. But more importantly, listen to what they are saying. You may go along for an interview with eight or nine or three or four questions but the person that you are interviewing may suddenly say something that triggers a whole new line of thought. Pick up and run with that. But you can only do that if instead of burying your head in your notebook, you are listening to what your interviewee is saying because they could give you the quote of a lifetime if they do that. Remember that you, when you are interviewing as a broadcast journalist, you are the representative of the viewing or listening public. You are their voice. They don't have an opportunity to be there interviewing the pop star, the politi 
the politician, the film star, the Premier League footballer, you have, you are their voice, you are the conduit, and it is your responsibility, therefore, to ask the kind of questions that the public would like an answer to. With politicians, I will just say this. Politicians are trained not to answer questions. My philosophy is quite simple with a politician, and I don't care whether it's a humble backbencher or the Prime Minister. I apply the same rule to all of them. Politicians are employees. When once you start earning and paying taxes like me, you will be paying their salary. And it doesn't matter whether it's a national politician or a local politician. They are your, our employees. They are there to represent us in, co in the House of Commons. They therefore, if they are asked a question, have a responsibility to answer it. Be firm, be polite, do not allow politicians ever to patronise you or to dodge the issue. And if you ask them a question, listen, because very often you may say to a politician, silly example, Minister, tell me today, what is the price of fish at Billingsgate? And they will go immediately into what they want to say, not what you have asked them. So listen always to what they say, because you want the answer to the question you've asked, not the question they wanted you to ask. And be persistent and make sure that you get the answer to the question that you have asked. And you can only do that by being in control of the situation, having done your research, listening to what they say, being firm and being polite, but remembering they are your employee. And as such, as the employer, if you ask a question, you should actually get an answer out of them. Put that, whatever, you're in, whatever you are doing, your job is representing the British public. That is your job. Put it before any ego trip you may have to prove how clever you are. Not until you're a really, really good interviewer. News agenda. Very quickly, I will just say, newspapers are political. News agenda, broadcast journalism versus print journalism. Newspapers are political. Broadcasters should always be apolitical. Newspapers are there to sell newspapers. We all know the politics probably of all of our major headline newspapers. They can give you sensational coverage of pop stars, footballers, wives, explicit embarrassing photographs of the stars. That's fine, that's what newspapers do. They also do a great job in investigative journalism, shining a light into those dark corners where charlatans and rip-off merchants of the hypocritical would love to hide. They can be partisan and sensational, but that is not the job of the broadcast journalist. The job of the broadcast journalist is to expose, yes, and to inform, yes, but to overtly influence, no. There are many accusations levelled at the BBC of strong left or right-wing bias. Individually, there may be people who work for the BBC who have those tendencies, but the corporation itself is not allowed to. It must remain apolitical. And when it does break through, that is a demonstration of a lack of strong editorial leadership in guarding against that bias. It is your job as a broadcast journalist to provide the public with enough unbiased information on whatever the subject for an individual to come to their own conclusion, having been given all the facts that they need to know so that they can reach a personal point of view. Taste. Terribly important, I think, in broadcasting. I think some of you may have seen this weekend David Walliams being taken to task for suggesting on a, on a chat show that he would like to perform a certain sexual act on a member of one of the boy pop groups. Now, if that was a live program, that was David Walliams' responsibility. If it was a recorded program, it was the responsibility of the editorial team to ensure that that did not go out. A broadcast journalist has a huge responsibility on what to show and how to express certain ideas and opinions. Very briefly, when I was at Television News, I can remember coming back from a horrific road crash, perhaps not quite as bad as the one in Taunton this weekend, but nevertheless, a pretty horrific road crash. And we had some very unpleasant footage. We had um, an editor at Television News called Derek Maud. Derek Maud was an old newspaper man, always used to have a fag hanging out the end of his mouth. I can remember we came back and he said to me, all right, Angela, does it infringe on private grief? And I said, some of the pictures do, yes. He said, great, we'll bloody have them. That was his attitude. He thought it made great television, but of course we didn't use that. 
We have stuff sent back from war zones that show the most horrific pictures, which you, the public, will never see, should never see, can never see, because you have to recognise that there are certain things that a mass audience should not be exposed to. If you go to a play, to a film, to a live performance by someone, that is your choice. You are making a positive choice, especially if you know the kind of material that you are going to see. But television, because television covers such a kaleidoscopic range of programmes and can be viewed by people of all ages, even after the nine o'clock watershed, you still have to recognise how very easy it is to offend. I, my personal view is old-fashioned values. I'm not being prudish. I'm not looking overtly for censorship. I just think there is common sense to know what would be acceptable to a mass audience. And as a broadcast journalist, you must recognise that too in your dealings and the reports that you put on screen or on the radio. Number nine, dealing with crews goes back to what I was talking about, about fame. Sum it up in one line. Be nice to them. You go on a crew when you're filming, you have cameras, sound, lighting, makeup, research, producers, directors, runners, drivers. When you're working in broadcasting, particularly in television, you have to work as a team. You must learn to be a team member. That's why I go back to tip number one. If you become famous, that does not give you the right to mistreat your crew, to be rude to your crew, or to run roughshod over them. Every individual in a crew has a job to do, and every individual is as expert at they, their job as you are at, their, at yours. You may think that you're somebody important because you're the face on the television, the voice on the radio, the one that people in the street will come up to and ask for an autograph, but you may be working with a cameraman who is absolutely outstanding in his field and maybe even a better cameraman than you are a reporter. Never underestimate the professionalism of the people with whom you work. You also, you must respect their professional excellence. In television, you can work very long hours. I shall be up at 4.30 on Wednesday because I have breakfast television to do and I won't finish work probably until 9 o'clock that night because of something else that I'm doing. When you're on film, particularly in the summer when you're on location, you start early and you finish late to get the light. Everybody can work a 10, 12, 14 hour day. That is quite normal. <laughs> You have to get on. There will be arguments, yes, but you have to learn how to apologise, how to put up with people that you may not like. You have to learn how to get on with the job, regardless of any tensions there may be in the team. It is the only way to guarantee a first-class end product. Another reason, there's a very old saying, be nice to people on the way up because you may need them on the way down. Nothing in broadcasting spreads faster than gossip and a bad reputation. If you do a bad job, if you are a difficult person to work with, that information will spread like wildfire throughout the profession. You want to go on working as a broadcast journalist? Just remember that when production teams meet to discuss a new production, they will say, what cameraman shall we have? Oh, so-and-so is brilliant. What sound? What lighting? When they come to talk about presenters, you only need one or two people around the room to say, oh, God, they're a bloody nightmare to work with, and you are out of a job. So work, be collaborative, be good with, to the people with whom you work. I worked on a programme called Health Check for the BBC, which had uh, a wonderful researcher who eventually became a producer. She is now head of commissioning programmes for BBC Television. She's one of my bosses. I do a lot of work for BBC Television daytime. Finally, you must love what you do. The hours are long and unsociable. Not everyone is going to earn half a million a year. Not everyone is going to be famous with producers knocking on your door, flavour of the month. If you are a freelancer, there are going to be feast and there are going to be famine. The day you wake up and think, what the heck am I doing? It is time for you to go and do something else. You must love your job as a broadcaster. You must like people, you must be fascinated by them, enjoy communicating with them, not being a broadcaster. What I said earlier, be a communicator. Be prepared to champion them. Whatever your subject, whatever the programme you're working on, must be something in which you have an interest and for which you have an enthusiasm. And you must always convey that enthusiasm, that professionalism, to your viewer 
and your listener. Listen to Fergal Keenan on Radio 4, brilliant broadcaster. Go on YouTube and get some of his things. You will hear it in his voice. Because the day that you lose your enthusiasm for your job, lose the will to go on, the public will hear it in your voice, they will recognise it in your face, they will see it in your body language. Do not ever estimate, underestimate your audience. That would be number 11, but we're not going to do that one. And if you do underestimate your audience, and they do pick up the fact that you are as bored as anything, you will have failed as a broadcaster and a communicator. So whatever you do in broadcasting, maintain your enthusiasm for it and the love of what you do. Take it from me, broadcasting is one of the best jobs you could ever have. You go to wonderful places, you do amazing things, you meet great people. People would give their right arm for some of the things that I have done and some of the things that you will do in your career. So those of you who choose to go into broadcast journalism, I wish you every success. Enjoy it. Angela, that was fantastic um, talking of enjoyment we certainly enjoyed that and um, I'm sure the students and everyone in the room had a terrific insight into what broadcast journalism's about um, I suspect one of the tips should be uh, don't over alliterate ten top tips is maybe going a bit too far um, right it's Sophia over to Sophia Great tips. I don't even know how to follow that, but thank you. Um, so if you're not here to listen to about fashion journalism, fear not, because I will speak a little bit about innovation, and it's really a lifestyle, so you can apply it to whatever you want to write about. Uh, my first tip, I guess, is to be up to the minute on all news. So if you're writing about fashion, it's fashion news you want to be up to the minute on, and as Angela was saying, know your subject, but it's really tips one and two. Um, the way I follow uh, fashion news is through Twitter, actually, because it's up to the minute. I actually sign up to um, Twitter messages to my phone if I want some news that happened right away. And um, I have actually been in the situations when I found out about um, Galeano's arrest um, a lot um, sooner before um, a few colleagues and I actually tipped them off. Um, so I have some tips you can follow on Twitter to be up to the minute on fashion journalism, but um, I figured I'd give the uh, email to Richard instead and he can send it out to you instead of me spelling out every Twitter name right now. Um, there are also a few top fashion critics who you want to read, um, like Hilary Alexander for instance and Godfrey Dini. Um, our own, you know, editor-in-chief of Vogue UK, Alexandra Schulman. She actually also writes a great blog for uh, the Daily Mail. Um, you should study who's who in fashion journalism. And I guess if you're going into food or travel, same, same deal. But in fashion, it's quite important to know who's who. You could be at an event standing next to someone who could be really useful to you and not know who they are, but... Um, if you did, you could talk to them and, you know, they're usually friendly and those fashion events, there's usually <coughs> loads of champagne, so everyone's quite friendly. Um, also have a few names who you, should, uh, who you should know, but it would be better to email that out to you later. Um, I also think it's great to have a blog. Um, you, you know, we live in the fantastic age of internet innovation and everything and just um, I would take advantage of that it's sort of your online resume you could show your style develop your style um, if you're applying for a job you could actually show the editor what you can do um, for that blog um, that's another tip is to have a, a good camera uh, because in fashion reporting as well as travel and food, etc. You're in situations where you can take a great picture 
Um, you use a lot of your own photography for a lot of your stories. It's really useful. Um, also, a lot of uh, fashion reporting is actually going the route of photography. For instance, Love Magazine, published by Vogue Magazine, it's all about photography. Um, the editors are actually now, um, I was telling Richard, not, you know, not so much about checking the articles as um, they are stylists and photographers um, who are just basically looking at photographs. Um, so that's something to keep up with. You should get really good at networking. Um, I feel like the only reason I have gotten where I've gotten in my career is because <coughs> I used to work in fashion PR and that sort of um, toughened me up a little bit and loosened me up a little bit to, you know, to um, able to talk to people at an event and strangers really um, and it, it's really important in the fashion industry everybody networks it is very much about who you know but it's actually so much about who you know that people hate giving jobs to someone just because you know someone at the company at this point but it still very much exists um, you should also know who the fashion PR companies are and like I was saying, if you're going into travel or other aspects, you should know who the travel PR companies are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, be friendly with those publicists. Um, read their press releases. Actually contact them. Let them know who you are. So they would send you information. Um, the more friends you have in the industry, really, the better. Just don't burn bridges. Always be good to people. And um, even if they're interns, if someone you know who might seem like they're completely useless to you, they might become useful. If, been known to enter events which have had completely closed doors. They wouldn't let anybody from Vogue in, and I've come in simply because I knew an intern on the door. Um, I would also be aware of new opportunities because things are changing. The magazine the print industry is, well, there's a lot of talk of it dying off, but um, I don't really see it just yet. However, Everything is going online, and that's great because it's more up to the minute and it's more eco. Um, but that's not exactly what I'm talking about. When I say new opportunities, yes, you could, you know, become the next new hip blogger. But also watch out for things like changes in the industry. For instance, fashion film right now is being is something um, that's becoming very popular, and um, you could look into writing about fashion films and at the moment you have the opportunity to become um, a leader in that field because there isn't very much reporting on fashion film at the m just yet. And you should also be aware of, I'm sorry, I was just going to skip back for a minute. Um, when speaking about networking, it's important to do social media networking as well. Um, that's just you have a great opportunity right now to meet and speak to and make contacts with people who you wouldn't possibly ordinarily have a chance to meet. And right now with Twitter and Facebook, you can <laughs> contact any of those people online. I've actually um, been able to contact some editors at magazines who wouldn't respond to emails, but for some reason they respond to Facebook messages or Twitter <laughs> messages. And um, it, it's a great tool. I think um, it's important to know how to use it. If you don't want to tweet, you don't have to. If you don't want to reveal any of your private details on Facebook, you don't have to. But on Twitter, you can follow the people that are important or current in the fashion industry, for instance, and you would get the latest news. You would get up to the second news um, on them, what they're tweeting or the news they're revealing. So you always be in a no. You don't have to tweet yourself if you don't want to, but it is sort of a tool to uh, publicize yourself. And in the fashion industry, it's quite important. And Angela was speaking about fame. And in the fashion industry, there's quite a lot of fame. There's a lot of new fame, bloggers becoming famous, like Tavi, the 12-year-old blogger. And uh, a lot of people actually sort of PR themselves and get jobs through publicizing themselves. And you can definitely use Twitter and Facebook to do that. But be aware of what you're tweeting and writing and sort of, I guess the best um, advice I've ever heard about Twitter is don't talk to yourself. A lot of the times you're sort of tempted to say something 
because you think it's interesting but it's actually just really you're talking to yourself like you wish there was someone there you could say it to but there isn't so you just write it on Twitter um, that's kind of a mistake people get bored of what you're writing about and you should be current and you should be friendly to people um, on social networks and kind of if any of you know what well not any of it some of you may not know what I'm talking about but um, retweeting is quite important just sort of helping other people out on social networks um, it would it will just pay off they will retweet your blog or the information you're putting out there it will all help kind of your fame um, and when writing also I mean you have chosen in my opinion a great profession you have the opportunity to influence people which is amazing I've uh, loved every second of what I do and it's important what you're putting out there and just be aware of that um, in the fashion industry specifically there are some publications where where um, complaining about things or using certain <coughs> language is perfectly appropriate and welcome um, and there are some where you should never ever criticize for instance if you want to work for Vogue you should never criticize anyone or anything really until you're established because the publication really cares about their advertisers and if you're talking something if, if you dislike for instance Burberry's latest show and you you know decide to put it out there just because you feel like you want to speak the truth it might bite you in the <laughs> afterwards because Vogue advertises with Burberry they don't want to lose their advertisers so just sort of be aware of what you're putting out there um, it's quite dangerous just <laughs> the fact that we're online now and you know don't rush don't put anything out there when you're under the influence if you're at a party and you just wanted to tweet something maybe it's not the best idea just sort of take a beat um, last not lastly sorry um, I would also look into opportunities in other countries uh, personally I mean as you must all guess that um, fashion industry is quite competitive because it is something that a lot of people want to do and in fact any of those lifestyle sectors like travel and restaurant reviews and so on very competitive but there's a world of publications out there and <coughs> just don't get discouraged you definitely I mean, if, you, if it's something you really want to do you can do it I used to walk past Vogue House and think wow you know if only I could like, go inside and see what the reception is like. And I ended up working there in a few months. It's just persistence, really. Um, so anything is possible. But also, I would look for opportunities abroad, because there's a lot of uh, publications, for instance, in Australia or South Africa or India who publish in English. And they would love to have reporters from London, from Fashion Week, from just London lifestyle coverage in general that you could literally just write to them, find out who the editor is online, everything's easy these days, and pitch an opportunity to p pitch yourself to them, basically. And uh, that's how I ended up working for uh, Vogue Italia. I just contacted them and asked them what they needed for Fashion Week, and they told me what they needed. I ended up going and doing it. The end. Um, so, yes, other, other countries, and just the last point is a little bit of sort of my own agenda but um, again you have the power to influence think about what's important to say right now to me fashion is uh, it's it's beautiful it's glamorous it's important but it's not as important as a lot of other issues out there right now for instance um, going back to innovation again you could write about eco fashion there isn't a lot of writing about eco fashion right now it's it's very trendy it's very now it's sort of starting to happen get on board and don't give up good choice <laughs> thank you yeah. again terrific advice um, <laughs> particularly sort of up to date all this tweeting and Facebook and retweeting how many in this room use Twitter hands up amazing but but you don't Angela nope. 
Okay. No, nope, I have I have a telephone. I can pick up a telephone and I can speak to people. I use email, and if anybody really wants to contact me, they can contact me by email. But I find the idea of sitting down and tweeting, and oh, today I went to Lincoln University. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. Um, I wrote that. <laughs> Twice. And, and, I'm not, and I'm not even going to say it's a generational thing, uh, because it's not, because I know a lot of people who are older than me who tweet all the time. I just find it a complete waste of time, I'm afraid. But it's a very personal thing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have to love it. But no. what about reading, what about the up-to-date news? Just there are things that are so current that come out right away and you could be the first person to know it. And what am I going to do Because you read it? it on Twitter. Well, I if you're, if you're interested in news, for instance, like, BBC website, it is the, the latest information, yeah, really. That's but the website. Yeah, right, that's right. So newspapers used to be quite current. Now it's the website that's even more current, but Twitter is even more current. The thing is, by the time I'm someone writes an article, half an hour went by. Unless there's going to be another 9 11, I can't think of anything that's going to happen that if I didn't know about it, within the next half hour would actually bother me. I'm going to know about it in half an hour because I listen to the radio all day and the radio is a wonderful source of bringing immediate news. It brings it on the hour and on the half hour. If there's a really important story, it will interrupt it. If you're in the office and you've got 24-hour news on, it's coming on all the time. I can't think of a single story that is so important that if I didn't know about it at that absolute minute, it would change my life. Most of these stories, they have a life which will go on for the next half mm. hour, and I'll know about it in half an hour, or actually I might be quite busy doing something else. So, um, if I was in the newsroom, and, and if I was still working in news, that is different. If you are mm -hmm. part of the news agenda, it is vitally important that you are aware of everything that is happening minute by minute. But not, I mean, one of the, one of the problems with rolling news is, and I've seen this happen in a studio, where something comes in, it hasn't been checked, you just get a, a flash going underneath which says, we've just heard a bomb has gone off in the middle of Lincoln University. Well, maybe it didn't. You know, and, they, and everybody gets panicked. And then the normal news agenda which says, check that, make sure that's what it mm. is. Sure, it's not somebody just letting off fireworks or whatever. And you've panicked people unnecessarily. Sometimes mm. fast is not always good or the best or the most accurate. So I suppose in a newsroom where you have an opportunity of checking things out, then yes, you do need to know what's happening minute by minute. But I actually think that most members of the general public, if there's a 10 minute or a 15 minute or a 30 minute delay on something that's happening in the news, it's not going to be the end of the world if you didn't know it until five o'clock instead of at half past four. Okay. <laughs> this is known as getting into the spirit Debate. of uh, Debate. The, uh, the argument. Let's have uh, some contributions from the audience. Uh, comments, questions, say your name. Um, yes. <coughs> probably is a generational right. thing. It's not something that I'm interested in, to be absolutely honest. Yeah. My agents are tweeting stuff all the time. Not just about me, but about all the other clients that they have. And if they think it's important, that's what they're doing. You're absolutely right. Yes. If you're wanting to start out now, I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about, because I think you know, it's a, it's a whole subject in itself, how you actually get into broadcasting, how to make the most of your talents, how to get people to be aware of you, how to get a job, yeah. how to, all of that is, is for another day and is another lecture. That, that's a, a half hour, 45 minute lecture. Right, you're but on. You, you're, Next time. <laughs> you're absolutely right. If you want to get established and you're young, yes, of course, tweeting is absolutely wonderful because you're out there, people know who you are, they get to know the kind of things that you're interested in. You are in touch with other people mm. all the time. You're networking all the time. Absolutely wonderful. But frankly, not for me. And mm. it is literally not for me because I am at the other end of that scale now. Mm. It, at the point where I don't have to establish myself. And you know, my, my life works in a, at a rather different pace and, and in an entirely different way. But it's out there. I mean, I think technology is wonderful. That's the great thing about working in broadcasting as I have now for nearly half a century, that because 
technology has moved on from the point where, when I did my first major report from Italy, we had to physically hand carry the film back from Rome on the, uh, um, they had um, a referendum on divorce and abortion. And the only way to get that film back, because we didn't have satellites, we didn't have any of that, was to physically hand carry the film and bring it back to London and edit it and put it out. Now, as we've seen from, from war zones, you can have people literally with shells exploding behind them because you, the viewer, are right there on the spot. That's the way that things have improved technically on that side of, of the job. But the, the tweeting, that all of these other things, the social networking that's available, it's meant that for all of the young people who are starting out in broadcasting now, they mm. have this amazing network, this mm. wonderful platform mm. on which to say, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I want. And mm. it's a great way of getting out and getting that message out. Thank you. May, I'm sorry, yeah. I know it's not a presidential debate, but <laughs> uh, we are having a little bit of a debate now because I personally read all of my news on Twitter. I don't read the BBC, but I read the BBC's tweets. And I know that they check what they fact check, what mm. they write. They're the BBC. They're not going to just put something out there. And for me, it's just sort of that little bit of information mm. that I need to know. It's just faster and more useful. I feel like it is good to read the yeah. news that way, personally. As I said, but I, I, I don't feel I need to anymore. No, no, I'm not saying it's everybody has thing. to. It's it is a personal, personal thing. thing. I absolutely agree on mm. that. But there's a lot of established individuals who tweet. For instance, Hilary Alexander, who we were oh, describing. Yeah. Yeah, she does. A yeah. huge fashion journalist who tweets mm. all the time. She tweets about Fashion Week nonstop, and then she starts tweeting about football for some reason, and so on and so mm. on. And people read it, and they love it. And that's her choice, like you were yeah, saying. personal choice. But it's, it's a tool, and you can use it. That was the point. I'm also too <laughs> busy to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, from, yes. Your name? Okay, I'm Lin Song from um, Journalism School. Um, I want to ask our charming lady Angela a question. Um, sometimes it is very difficult for our journalists to get the answer uh, from the interviewees, especially uh, when we're facing those uh, celebrities or high-level officials. And um, I was wondering what the exact strategies will you employ um, when you want to ask those um, tough questions or sensitive questions, thank you very much. Be persistent. It's as simple as that. I mean, it, um, there are some, some questions that you ask, which it depends on the person that you're interviewing. If you're talking to, you mentioned personalities. So, um, sometimes, and I don't know if, if this is the kind of question you have in mind, but if you wanted to ask something that was extremely personal and extremely private, I actually do believe that even though you do a job which is public, that gives you all the more right to have a private life. So for instance, there are certain things that journalists ask me about which I absolutely refuse to discuss and they involve my, my private life. I will never, for instance, discuss the men in my life. I just do not. It is a rule that I have that is my private life which has nothing at all to do with the job that I do. It impacts on it not at all. Therefore, every journalist that ever talks to me knows that that is an area I will not discuss. Quite simple. But, because I think that is intrusive. So I think that if you ask what is an intrusive question, and the person on the receiving end says, sorry, that's an area where I'm not prepared to, to, to talk, that's what you have to accept. Because if they're like me, you just won't get an answer. There are, however, occasions where you do need to ask the tough question of the footballer who is splashed all over the papers because he's been having an affair. It is absolutely legitimate for you to ask a question. And if they go all coy at you and refuse to answer, well, if you're, you know, depending on how you've asked the question and how it's been answered, you probably get your answer there and then, but in the way that they refuse to answer you. Um, if you are talking to a politician or someone who is accountable in some way, like um, the head of one of the utilities, like a bank manager or whatever, someone who really is accountable for their actions, then you must be persistent. You really must. 
last at the beginning of last week, I was interviewing um, Chris Hume, who is the Energy Minister, mm. and I had to ask him the same question three times to get an answer out of him. And I listened. I asked the question, and I listened to what he said, and he didn't answer. So I said. I actually said on film, that was a very interesting answer, Minister, but it was not the answer to the question that I asked you, so I'm going to ask you again, <laughs> and I did, and he still didn't give me the answer, and I had, and, and it was filmed interview, it wasn't live, but I was able to say again, actually, Minister, you still haven't asked the question, I do want to, and I rephrased it, <coughs> and I finally got the answer out of him. You have to, you have to be polite, but you have to be persistent mm. and it's as simple as that but you also I think as an interviewer have to recognize that if someone if you are asking a particularly intrusive and personal question unless it is someone who for some reason has had their personal life splattered all over the newspapers or whatever and therefore there's every other aspect of their life that has been public there are those areas that some people choose to keep private and I think I believe as someone who was on the receiving end of that have every right to keep it private yeah. Okay, um, it's quarter past seven. In theory, we should finish, but I sense that there's at least ten minutes. Okay. Is that all right with the audience? Because I don't want people walking out. If we agree, then we all stay. Are we agreed? Ten minutes? Any objections? If you have to leave, maybe now. So we're all staying. Ten minutes. Okay, go for it. Yes. Um, I had the same opinion as you. I, I had the same opinion as you. I didn't like Twitter until the London riots, actually. And then I started following the London riots hashtag, the feed, which actually said about where the riots were going. And I found out about where the, um, basically where the towns were flaring up with problems. And I was actually able to follow it to my own hometown. Mm. And I felt really glad that I could have a much more quicker view. Do you not think in a situation like that, Twitter is actually very useful? Well, yes. I mean, I was talking to somebody <coughs> last night who was saying precisely that. That they actually lived um, where the riots were at their height and knew. But at the same time, they were re reading things on Twitter that were a load of old rubbish. That, had n that bore no resemblance at all to what was happening outside their mm. front door. So I think, again, you have... You, you have to be discerning, you have to be objective. And you know, if that is how you want to get your news, that is fine. I, all I am saying is that I prefer to get my news from the radio, from the internet, um, and from other sources. But I think if you're someone who is comfortable with that and familiar with that, by all means use it. It's just, it's another tool in the armory. Yeah. It's just one that I choose not to use, that's all. It's just a personal thing. Okay, the back row. A lot of the pictures that came through were shot by individuals on their telephone. That, this is another wonderful thing, of course, we've now all got Blackberries and iPhones and things which take not only photographs but also video. And at one time I can remember that television news used to if, they, if someone had been there with their cine camera or their video camera, you would see um, amateur footage would be used of, of something because a news, they were on the spot and a news camera couldn't get there in time and so people were using that video. Um, I, th I think I'm right in saying that when um, Concord had its terrible accident, the French Concord, and as a result we have no Concord anymore, and that was all an amateur who was actually f happened to be at the airport filming on that day. Mm -hmm. But now, because we have our mobile phones which take all of these things, all of those guys who were involved in what happened to Gaddafi were shooting, were taking film of it. As far as I am aware, none of the mainstream broadcasters used it. It went on YouTube. And unfortunately, there was no way of stopping that. I think that all the main broadcasters throughout, the, most of them throughout the world, decided that it was a matter of poor taste and therefore did not put it on the broadcast media. But it goes mm. back to what I was saying before. You can choose whether or not you want to go and see a film or a particular 
live performance. You can choose whether or not you therefore go onto YouTube to see that particular footage, which is graphic and unpleasant. Mm. But it is not necessarily something that most broadcasters felt they wanted to put into homes. And I think that was the right decision. But actually now, because we have YouTube and you have all of these other vehicles available to you, it is very, very difficult to stop it. And I don't know who, it can only be the, <coughs> which is why I said as journalists, you have to learn what is good taste or bad. I mean, do you think it was good taste or bad taste? Well, I actually saw on the BBC, because I'm um, the BBC yeah. and they had it up on the TVs. Um, they had a uh, sort of video of him being dragged through the streets yes. and all of that stuff. And then, obviously, the next day, his face was on the front of all the papers. I actually thought it was poor taste. I didn't like it at all. You're using the right kind of judgment, and, and I think mm. that's what it comes down to. In de as all of you go through your careers, there will be moments where you are not just journalists, where you will become editors, producers, executive producers, directors, specialists, consultants, whatever. You will be asked to make those kind of judgment calls, and it will come down to what you as an individual think is acceptable or not. Right. Great sense of fashion, Gaddafi, don't you think? He had. Exactly. He right. had a fashion expert. Who, you will know better than me. A woman who used to design his outfits. Brilliant. And tell him what to wear. He still yeah. got the mess in the dress. But yeah. 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 <laughs> right. It's a regular inspiration, yeah. that one. Yeah. Go for it. Back row. Things that you know that you're bad at, or things that, or getting the things perfect, or the things that you're good at. Both of them, you have to. You will have natural talents at certain things, and and Sophia will, will back me up on this when it comes to writing. Um, you you will have natural talents in some areas. You have to work on those to perfect them. But equally, if you want to be a rounded broadcaster, you must be. As I go back to what I said, you must be honest with yourself. Mm. Recognize those things that. It's, it's good, bad, and indifferent. Recognise the things that you're good at, work at them, perfect them. Recognise the things at which you're pretty indifferent, because you know that you can probably work on those. The things you're bad at, if you're never going to get them right, move on, do something else. But it comes down with everything to being honest with yourself. And if you are not particularly good at something, but it's an area in which you specifically want to work, work at it, get better at it. You may never then be brilliant at it, but you will be better than you would have been otherwise, and you will be that much more of a rounded performer and broadcaster. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, agreeing slowly. Yeah. Come. Yeah. No, 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 no. This gentleman in the middle? Yeah. Eric Bell. <clears throat> As usual, I feel as though I've known you for so long, but I like to ask you, how are the legs? How are they there? Great still legs. working, <laughs> and they still carry me around, um, and they seem to be fine the last time I saw them, yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> right. Lady at the back, yeah. Yes. I think because it's an innovation and because people are actually looking for someone just like themselves to write something that's not edited. Um, they feel like it's uninfluenced and... Original. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. That's yes. what we were saying about being an original. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sometimes about when I get into the media industry. Broadcast is not my first point of call, but it might at some point be there. Um, about how I get on in 20 or 30 years when I'm of an... Of a certain age. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, whereas, <laughs> as, I know there's a massive age to row has been for like the last six or seven years at the BBC. Um, yet still people like Chris Evans are bringing back Moira Stewart and uh, you've done bits on one show recently. Have you? That's really good. Right. <laughs> um, do you think what do you think that is is it with uh, broadcasting there's a younger generation taking over or still an affinity for the people who are well known and respected in 
broadcasting to carry on? Yes, to all those questions. I'll try and reduce it as much as I can because this is a big subject. Um, I'm now 67 and I'm still working full time for the BBC on a 20 part series which as I say is going out in November, prime time and daytime television. Um, it is my belief that um, you, you have to have youth and beauty with age and experience. You have to have both ends of the spectrum. I was young once, I was in my early 20s when I started working in television, I'm now in my 60s and I'm still there, which means you start, you get experience, you learn, and if you're any good at what you do, you keep working at it. And just because um, some new people come along at this end of the table doesn't mean to the one, that the old ones sitting at this end of the table have got to be pushed off the edge, because if they're still good at their job, they have an important job to do and an important role to fulfil. And frankly, an awful lot of the new people coming into television are absolutely terrific at what they do. Of course mm. they are. And they're going to go on to be even better as they gain experience. But that is what they're lacking in their 20s and their 30s. They may be original, they may be wonderful, but they don't have the experience. The people at the other end have experience at what they do, which means that I can be thrown into a... Um, a 24 camera outside broadcast live situation and know what I'm doing, whereas a 20 year old probably wouldn't. Not because I'm a brilliant broadcaster or better than them, but because I've had 45 years in which to learn how to do it. So you actually need both ends of the spectrum. And I am convinced that members of the public do not give a toss about the age of the presenter. And I rest my case by giving you two words, David Attenborough. David Attenborough is in his 80s, is anyone going to tell David Attenborough, push off, you're 80, we want somebody young to do it? Because I don't believe somebody young would have his experience, his delivery, his charisma, his presence and his authority to do the kind of brilliant programming that he does. A rounded broadcaster, broadcasting organisation that is, as opposed to individual, <coughs> needs to have youth, fun, innovation, experience, ability, the reason that I now do Rip Off Britain, which is a, a prime time consumer programme, I do it with Gloria Honeyford, and I, I forgot her name the last time because she's only just joined mm -hmm. us. Um, we did it last year with Jenny Murray. I mean, you know, the, all of us were in our 60s, and we were asked to do it because the public recognise that we have authority. We're not going to be patronised by the chairman of Barclays. Julia Somerville has now joined us this season. Again, Julia has been in the news for as long as Gloria and I have. We're not patronised, we're not afraid. When, when the minister doesn't answer the question, I'm not going to sit back meekly and say, oh, all right, minister. I'm going to say to him, you haven't answered the question, I want an answer, please. So you need, if you are going to be the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, BBC, any of those stations, any of the plethora of television stations there are, if you want to have a level of good journalism, you have to have the new and the innovative, and you have to have the mature and the people who are trusted by the public. So yes, there's been a lot of talk about ageism. The BBC is not ageist. Individuals who work within it may have ageist attitudes, but the BBC itself is still employing me and lots of people of my age group. We are all there still working. And if you are any good at what you do, producers will go on wanting to work with you. There are many, many reasons why individuals no longer work as they get older. It may have to do with their age in some cases. It may have to do with the fact that the producer decides, I actually don't want you, Angela, to present my programme. I want that person over there. Producers have individual choice in this. But if you're any good at what you do, people will want to go on working with you, regardless of your age. So hang in there and be good at what you do. <laughs> right. We've had a terrific discussion, Angela and Sophia. I think we've all learnt a lot. Let's thank the speakers.